Good morning and welcome to CN Jenkins. We're so excited to have you today and stay tuned as Pastor Cannon gives us an uplifting sermon that's going to help us in our everyday lives. If you want to stay involved on our YouTube channel, make sure you leave some comments, make sure you subscribe, and make sure you like our page. Hey, we're so happy to have you and welcome. Hope you enjoy. For God's love, God's grace, God's face and presence in our lives. Pray with me. Lord, we love you today. We love you because you first loved us. For your word said you loved us so much you gave your only begotten son. And it is from that love, God, that we come with an attitude of gratitude to say thank you. Thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, for another Sabbath worship. Thank you, God, for health, strength, and daily bread. Thank you, God, for making way out of no ways. Thank you, God, for being a healer. Thank you, God, for being a deliverer. Thank you, God, for being a prayer-answering God. God, we thank you for all the things that we can, we can, we didn't have enough, enough tongues to say thank you, God. We just say thank you and 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 thank you again and again. Lord, we know that you have already worked things out. God, you've already made a way. And for that, we give you thanks. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts continue to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time. If you could stand up all over the congregation and at home as we prepare for the reading of God's Word today coming to us from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, reading from a New Living Translation of the Holy Word. Luke chapter 10, verses 29, 25 through 29. It is our custom to read the Word together, knowing that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Let us read together. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, and so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated, giving God thanks and praise again for this day, for this moment, for this time of worship. Calling your attention to that verse of scripture that simply says you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Will you read that with me, please? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And my friends, with the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I want to lift up this text today. And if I could put a tag on it, it's simply to call this sermon, When Love Becomes a Habit. When Love Becomes a Habit. The Holy Ghost smile, let's smile at your neighbor, tell them, say, you working on your habits? Ask, are you working on your habits? We've been into this about three weeks now, trying to develop some good habits. So today, we are talking about when love becomes a habit. Church, recognizing that many things don't happen by accident, but most of things by providence more than coincidence. I think it would be safe to say today that on this February the 13th, 2022, the day before February the 14th, 2022, there may be one or two persons gathered in worship today and one or two watching online who just might have love 
on your mind. Let me say it this way. My friends, realizing that Christmas was 49 days ago and Easter is nine weeks from today and March Madness is 28 days from today and at 6 o'clock tonight in Los Angeles, California, the 56th Super Bowl will kick off and even though all of those things happening, I know that on February the 13th, one day before February the 14th, there might be somebody who has something on their mind, somebody Somebody dressed in red, somebody with a flower, somebody dreaming about tomorrow, somebody with chocolate in your thoughts, somebody is thinking because you might have love on your mind. And when I say love on your mind, I'm not talking about Natalie Cole's 1977 hit, that slow drag, pull me closer song, I got love on my mind. I'm not talking about the 1991 hit, Billboard hit by Luther Vandross, the power of love. But when I say love on your mind, I'm lifting up what Plato said. He says, he who love touches walks not in darkness. Okay, let me go with Octavia Butler, that familiar, that, that very infamous African-American writer. She says it this way, kindness eases change, love quiets fear. Okay, let me help you a little bit closer. What did Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King say about love? He said that love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. And of course, y'all, you know that infamous quote by Anonymous, which simply says it like this. The opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it is indifference. The opposite of faith is not hearsay, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifference. Okay, you're not feeling this, so let me explain it to you this way. When I say love on your mind, I want you to recognize, y'all, that it, when love is not on your mind, you can't like other people. When love is not on your mind, it, it is hard for you to care. When love is not on your mind, you, you don't know how to feel. When love is not on your mind, it's hard for you to connect. When love is not on your mind, it's hard for you to live. All right, I don't know if they got it, brother. Let's just let me break it down like a fraction and give it to you this way, okay? I got to explain to you how I understand love by going to one of my favorite Disney movies, Beauty and the Beast. But if you know of anything about Beauty and the Beast, I confess to you, I have watched Beauty and the Beast more than a little bit. I, I've seen it in theaters. I've seen it, Dr. Moreau, on my VHS, on my VCR. I, I've seen the Beauty and the Beast on a DVD, and I've even seen it while I, I have streamed it, shall we say, on Netflix. Nevertheless, good, goodness is, is in Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast has a plot, y'all. It's a plot starting from a dude who is really ugly. He's ugly not on the outside, but he's also ugly on the inside. And, and he is a beast. He's a beast in his speech and a beast in his character and a beast in the way he treats folk. But then there is beauty. And the good news about beauty, y'all, is that anytime beauty walks into the room, beast has to sit down. Okay, you're not feeling it. Anytime beauty walks into the presence of ugliness, ugliness has to sit down. Anytime beauty has a way to knock on the door, ring the doorbell, send you an instant message, come on your, on, on your Facebook, Facebook, Facebook page, you have to recognize however ugly you may have been acting in the past, it's time for ugly to sit down and for beauty to stand up. It's a story, y'all, of, of, of this guy who, who is transformed because beauty comes into his presence. Not because beauty is beautiful, because, but because beauty allows the ugliness to be loved. And that is where we're really hanging out today, this Sunday morning, Sister Wanda. We are talking about how God causes us to take our love into some ugly situations. How God causes us to be loving to some unlovable people. Not me, but the person beside you has a cousin in Men Hill who's unlovable. 
I'm teasing you, Miss Lisa. I know there's some lovable people and men here, but, but you might have some relatives on the other side of the state line, on the other side, I'm not saying South Carolina, but you got some Virginia relatives who are just not lovable. And, and all I want you to know is that love has a way of conquering all kinds of evil. Love has a way of lifting you up Oh, and when you are down, love, my friends, I'm calling your attention, if I could, to the understanding that when you love folk, you care about them. When you love folk, you think about them. When you love folk, it, it has you to remember where people have brought you from. Okay, let me see if I can explain it to you this way. Uh, Miss Rooker, I don't know if you grew up watching Mr. Rogers. Or Mr. Rogers, y'all, was on TV for 32 years, from 1968 until 2000. Mr. Rock, Fred Rogers, the Presbyterian minister from Pittsburgh Seminary, he, that's right, he, so if I don't make it preaching, I could go on TV and be <laughs> welcome to my neighborhood. Come on, help me now. But for 800, y'all, and 95 episodes, Brother L, Mr. Rogers, he worked with two generations. He got an Emmy Award, y'all, and at his Emmy Award, he began to give a challenge to those who were listening. Here's what he said uh, right, right here, Ms. Glennie. Mr. Rogers says that I am here not because of what I have done, but what others have done for me. I am experiencing what God has in my life, not because I've been all that and then some but those who may have died, those who are far away, and those who are even present right now. Mr. Rogers says, for 32 years, I was able to be successful and impactful because of the love of somebody else. Let me explain it to you this way. Here's what Mr. Rogers challenges his audience to do. He says, for the next 10 seconds, I just want you to think about the people that love you in a special way. For the next 10 seconds, I want you to reflect on those who poured into your life. For the next 10 seconds, I'm talking actors and actresses, producers and, and directors. The audience was full of folk, y'all. And for 10 seconds, you couldn't hear a mumbling word, but you all you heard was sniffles. And all you could see was tears dropping down folks' face because they were remembering the people who had poured into their life. Now, here's how Mr. Rogers made you shout. Mr. Rogers said, because of what they did, you are who you are today because of what they poured into you. That's why you have what you have. And I got to pause right there for somebody to give God some praise right now because of what somebody else did for you in your, is there anybody here who can say, Reverend, just stop the sermon right there. Let me give God a hallelujah shout right there because somebody prayed for me. Somebody had me on their mind. Somebody went by and went out of their way to make sure that I could have my way won't you just help me give God thanks for what all God does in our lives? Just 10 seconds. 10, I want to thank God for the day. 9, I want to thank God for the day. 8, I want to thank God for the day. 7, I want to thank God for the day. 6, I want to thank God for the day. 5, I want to thank God for the day. 4, I want to thank God for the day. 3, I want to thank God for the day. 2, I want to thank God for the day. 1, I want to thank God for right now. You see, I don't need Mr. Rogers to help me remember what God has done in my life. I can just look back over my life and say, if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Oh, hear what I'm saying today, church, because when love becomes a habit, you don't need a preacher to tell you to think about what God has done in your life. What, what, what is a habit? A habit, again, is an inquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it becomes almost involuntary. That's what Webster say. But a habit is stopping to look both ways before you cross the street. A habit is putting your seatbelt on without being told. A habit is cutting the radio on, not, not because you want to listen to something, because you're in a habit. A habit. Many of us have habits that we don't even know about. Duke University did a study years ago. It says that 40% of the things we do every day are done habitually, which means we don't even think about it. You don't think about how to tie your shoe, taking the left and the right string and putting them together and making a bow. And then you don't even, th you just tie your shoes. You don't think about how do you make coffee. You just put the thing under the little thingamajiggy and you push it down and push and it works. 
out of habit. You see, I like the way Stephen Covey said it. He says, habit is the intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. Knowledge, what to do. Skill, how to do it. Desire, want to do it. Come on, habit. It's the intersection of knowledge, what to do. You've got to know what you're doing in your habits. Don't create some bad habits. My buddy Brian is here, and Brian used to teach me how to play golf, and I wouldn't listen. I told him I was practicing. And he said, you're getting good at it, Rev. I said, am I? He said, you're getting good at some bad habits. <laughs> Joseph is my exercise partner. Joseph says, Rev, I don't care how much you exercise, you can't exercise some bad eating habits. Is this thing on test one? <laughs> You've got to be knowledgeable, then you have to have skill, but you also have to have desire. In Luke chapter 10, y'all, we get what we call the great commandment, the great commandment to love God with all the heart, mind, soul, and spirit. It is the bedrock of Christianity, and if you are calling yourself a child of Almighty God, you have to put Luke chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 23 and Mark chapter 12. It's all the same story. Put it into your lexicon on your Rolodex so you can recall it all the time. Love the Lord God with all your heart mind, soul, and spirit. Understand what Greg Crochelle says about habits. He says what? Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. I'm imploring upon you to make love a habit that you will do consistently. Love a habit that you will do every day. Love a habit that you would do even without thinking about it. The first commandment is to love God. Christ answered the lawyer's question. What is the greatest his commandment. He says, love God. Love the Lord thy God. Now, let me just pause there parenthetically and just explain to you, Brother Tyrone, what what Christ is saying to the lawyer. He says, love the Lord thy God. Who is thy God? Thy God is the God that spoke to Moses. When Moses says, what do I say to the Pharaoh who's been holding my people in bondage for 400 years? God says, tell Pharaoh that I am. Okay, let me back up and say it again. They didn't get it, Dr. Brown. Moses is saying, I don't know what to say to this Pharaoh. What do, this, what do I say to this regime? What do I say to this king? What do I say to this monarch? What do I say to the president who's had his foot on our neck, his foot on our back, his foot all over? What do I say to this system? And God says, tell that system, I am that I am. And somebody hear me this Sunday morning because God is speaking that word into the systems that try to hold you down, the systems that try to keep you captive, the systems that try to keep you from being all that God wants you to be. God is saying, tell that system, I am that I am. What is I am? I am an overcomer. I am a redeemer. I am a healer. I am a provider. I am a prayer answering God. I am a way in the middle of no way. I am coming up when people try to put you down. Is there anybody here want to fill in the blank with I am? I am a scholar. I am entrepreneur. I am a musician. I am talented. I am, okay, help me preach your own sermon. I I am, I am, I am, I am. You see, when you folk, when you face people that sometimes try to put you down in the habit of love, you have to say, I love the Lord thy God, my God. The second thing, I love my neighbor as I love myself. You see, the command says, love the Lord thy God. Loving God, y'all, is an act that is alive and active, not dead and inactive. It's alive and active when I say I love the Lord. I, I'm alive and active in the way I live my life. I, I'm alive and active. I, I, I love to see the Monroes. They drive in every, every, every Sunday from South Carolina. I love South Carolina. I don't know if I'll go to church in South Carolina. <laughs> but here's their testimony. You don't go to the church that is nearest to you. You go to the one that is dearest to you. <laughs> when you have a church family that is dear to you, you'll drive from Canelias and Huntersville. You'll drive from, 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 from Rock Hill and, and, and Lancaster. You'll even drive from Mid Hill.
when you love the Lord your God, it empowers you then to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, a loving relationship, y'all, involves commitment and loyalty. God constantly says, thou shalt love no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. God demands that our total commitment and loyalty is to almighty God. You see, a habit of love that I want to share with you briefly this morning is that a habit of love involves trust and respect for the person that you love. When you are, have a habit of love, you don't treat people any old kind of way, nor, nor do you allow yourself to be treated any old kind of way. When you understand that God has made you a little bit lower than the angels, but well above the animals, that means you don't act angelic, but you definitely don't act like an animal. You are created in God's own image. It is loving the person just for who he or she is. Don't go changing. <laughs> Try to please me. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I, I got to fast forward to a little bit of uh, a little bit more more contemporary. All right, like brown skin. Love me some brown skin. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. How about my hair? All right, come on, NDR. Is there any NDR folk in the house? I mean, is there any, any Heather Headley folk in the house? All right, the, the issue is you got to love people for who they are. Don't try to, don't go changing to try to please. I just take me just the way I am. Okay, let me move quickly. That ain't on the paper. Let me go next. A habit of love involves giving and surrendering of oneself. Giving and surrendering of oneself. I don't know what you're going to get on tomorrow, but you need to love somebody today. Every day is a day of, no, Valentine's. Valentine. That was not a trick question, but it is a day of Thanksgiving. Every day is a day of Valentine. You, you have to get into a habit of loving and giving. You have to have a habit of knowing and sharing. Uh, again, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You see, the greatest of, of, of the commandments, Jesus is speaking to the lawyer. He says, these two, if you get these two right, he gives what Bishop Jakes calls a, a tremendous uh, a bypass or a tremendous pass on an exam. Think about it, students. If, if the teacher says you've got 100 questions on the exam, but if you just get two right, okay, all right, let me go to this side. Think about it, y'all. You've got, you've got 15 payments left on your mortgage. The mortgage company says, if you just pay two times. Okay. Mm. Think about it. Those in the back, those in the back, those in the back. All right, think about it. Your boss lady, your boss man says, look, there are 20 days of work in the month. If you just come to work just two days. You see, y'all, there are more than 900 commandments in the Old Testament. The lawyer says to Jesus, which is the great commandment? Jesus says there are two. If you get these two right, y'all see the equation that we have here? That God is saying, if I can get you to love God, then and you love somebody else, you can make it into heaven. God is saying, if I can get your vertical right, your horizontal will take care of itself. You see, you see, the thing about it, and I didn't bring my prop with me. I was going to have some fun with this. But tonight, tonight, y'all, I want you to get them eyes of, uh, getting in the eyes of Matthew Stafford and Joe Burrow. Matthew Stafford and Joe Burrow are the quarterbacks for the NFL, the Super Bowl team. Now, of course, I don't have a Cincinnati shirt like somebody else got on. <laughs> And I didn't fit into my L.A. Ram stuff, so that was not going to be worn today. <laughs> but the quarterbacks, y'all, they, they are tremendous athletes. Think about it, y'all. They, they've got people rushing at them as fast as they can, two and, two and 300 pounds, trying to hit them as hard as they can. They've got a total of three seconds at the most, y'all, to survey the field and to throw a ball at somebody's running as fast as they can in a spot they haven't arrived at, y'all. These quarterbacks are phenomenal. Now, what I learned from an interview with Andrew Luck, it's, 
Andrew Lux says, I don't do it because I am thinking. I do it because it's on autopilot. He says that I am a quarterback and a proficient quarterback throwing the ball, not because I think of where I'm going to throw the ball, but because of mechanics and rhythm and repetition and over and over again, that if I say that the ball is going to be thrown over there, I can look over here and throw it over there knowing that the mechanics of my body has taught me to turn this way, okay? Andrew Luck helped me understand the mechanics of being a disciple of Almighty God. When you're a disciple of Christ, there are things that may happen in our lives that we are not able to control. Things that happen in our lives that are beyond our grasp. Things that happen in our lives that will turn our world upside down. But when they happen, I don't think about what I'm going to do. I'm all, okay, you're missing it. When sickness comes and I'm able to deal with my sickness, be it mentally or physically, and I don't know which way to turn, I I go to automatic pallet, and I know right where I am in the midst. Okay, you're not getting it all, y'all. When people say they love you, but they treat you a whole different way. When people talk about you, not just behind your back, but in your face. When people call you every name but a child of God, instead of me remembering what I used to do, how I used to act, I'm an automatic pilot. I'm down here. You see where I am right now. It's on your knees out of a habit of love. On your knees out of a habit of faith. On your knees. It ain't Andrew Luck, who's a quarterback. I believe my, 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 my offensive coordinator is upstairs looking at me right now, calling the right play that I have to run in life. Okay, I'm preaching harder than you responding, so. I'm talking about a personal relationship. Personal relationship, y'all, it can only be maintained through communication and commitment. A habit of love is going to cause you to a personal relationship. Recognize this. God, y'all, wants us to make loving our neighbor the first order of our lives. Which moves me now to that great passage that we didn't read all the details, Miss Rooker, but it's there about the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is a phenomenal story of how a man leaves from, from Jerusalem going down to Jericho, and he is robbed. A man leaves from Jerusalem. It implies, Brother Givens, that he is Jewish, going to Jericho, and he is robbed. And the people who come to his aid is not the people that you would think to come to your aid. Let me say it this way. The people who came to his aid are not the folk that you would think would come to his aid because the person that came to his aid was, Jesus says, a good Samaritan. Now, get the context here, Sister George, because the Jewish lawyer is asking Jesus about, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus flips the script, and he says, a good Samaritan. Recognize this, Pastor Rick, you know it, is that the Jews, they had nothing good to say about the Samaritan. And Jesus even takes the word, Sister Nancy, and he says, a good Samaritan was able to come by and help the man who was robbed. You're not getting it. Jesus answers the, the, the lawyer's question. Now, again, this was not a lawyer who was chasing ambulance. This is not a lawyer who was doing corporate deals. He was really a lawyer, meaning an expert in the law. He knew the answer to his questions. He knew the answer that, he was, that Jesus was going to give him. But this man teaches us a valuable lesson, y'all, because Jesus says a good Samaritan is able to help those who are hurting. In essence, who is my neighbor? My neighbor is not who I see in the mirror. My neighbor is the one I see out my window. Whew. I know that was good. Let me say that again. My neighbor, y'all, is not the one who looks like me. My neighbor is the one who has a need that God allows me to meet. The love of Almighty God is going to come into my heart and come into my spirit, come around me in such a way that I'm going to see a need and meet a need. Who is my neighbor? What makes a good neighbor? Number one, a good neighbor is somebody who is responsible and knows how to keep the noise down. Smile at your neighbor and say, keep the noise down, keep the noise down. All right, look at somebody else and say, you're making too much fuss. A good neighbor is somebody who knows how to keep the noise. Anybody ever lived in an apartment with some noisy, no, noisy, noisy, noisy folk above you? And I don't care how many times you took that broom handle and hit the ceiling. 
They still made noise and they still stomp. A good neighbor knows how to keep the noise. That If you're going to be a good neighbor, don't cause confusion in other folks' life. Number two, a good neighbor is somebody who does not overstep your boundaries and they mind their own business. Tell your neighbor, mind your own business. Come on in the chat box right there, type, mind your own business. A good neighbor practices love and knows how to mind their business. It, it's your business. It's not my business. If I can help, let me help. But please don't let me meddle. A good neighbor is somebody who is proactive, attentive, and empathic. Uh, uh, it has some empathy about themselves. They've walked in shoes like you. They've been places like you. They, they felt like you have felt. A good neighbor is somebody who is taking the first step to invite you and to bring you in. Here's the last one. What is the sign of a good neighbor? Somebody who does not gossip. Don't gossip. I'm not talking about your neighbor who lives on your cul-de-sac or down the street around the corner. Sometimes your neighbor can be sitting beside you in church and they are the biggest gossiper. Look at me. Don't look at them. <laughs> they can't keep nothing. You tell it to them in confidence and before you leave the church parking lot, it's already on Facebook. A good neighbor is one who understands I've got to not just lift you up, but as I lift you up, I'm going to pray you up. The Bible says when you see one that slips, the Bible says don't you go by yourself lest you are tempted to fall into the same temptation, but bring somebody along with you to restore that person who has fallen. Here's my five steps on being a making love a good habit. Number one, stability and character. Stand fast and see the glory of the Lord. How do I make love a habit? I have to have a sense of standfastness. I have to have a sense of stick to itiveness. I have to have a sense of perseverance. If I'm going to be all that God wants me to be, I've got to practice love continuously. Number two, I've got to rejoice in the Lord. Paul says it to the church in Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can I become all that God wants me to be with a love habit? I have to have a habit of rejoicing. Number the three, how do I have this love habit? I have to always pray. Say always pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray in the morning. Pray in the noon. Pray in the evening time. Pray like the Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Pray like Daniel in the lion's den. Pray like those who've been coming up the rough side of the mountain. If you're going to call yourself a child of God, make love habit a habit of prayer. What is number four? You've got to control your thoughts. Here's the easy one. Think about what you think about. You see, the mind cannot process positive and a negative at the same time. If I tell you to think about what you think about, then you cannot be thinking happy thoughts and not be, be living happy thoughts if you're thinking negative things. If, if you th Think about this. Think about this. Don't pat your right foot. What did you think about? <laughs> You've got to think about what you think about. Control your thoughts. Whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and good report, think on these things. Here is the last one. You've got to have uh, contentment in your heart. Paul says, I've had plenty, and Paul says, I've had little, but I thank God that I've got to the place I am content in my heart. See, a love habit means I have to, have to be content, not on what you have or what you are striving for. I've got to be content on where God is moving in my life. I've got to be appreciative of what God has done in my life. The lawyer, y'all, he knew the answer to his question. I don't know why he raised the question. Maybe he was looking for a loophole. And there may be some lawyer types in the church right now or watching online who were looking for a loophole, a, an extra way of getting out of the obligations of the Lord. But the Lord says, no, get 
these two right. Love the Lord thy God. Then love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, how can we love our neighbor if our neighbor or we ourselves have a cold heart? And I've got to close right here because I, I got to go back to Disney because I had some little people at my house this weekend. And of course, when you have little people at your house, you watch little people movies. So the little people reminded me of one of their favorite movies called Frozen. Now, when the little people came to live with me two years ago, I didn't even know Frozen existed. Because I got big people who used to be little people. But now I got little people who are little people, and they watch little people movies. And Frozen is a little, anybody got some little people in your life? You're going to get this story called Frozen. Frozen, y'all, is the story by Anna. Anna, who is a princess, and, and Elsa. Elsa, they live in Arendelle, and Arendelle is a make-believe place like Walt Disney does a lot of places that are make-believe, but go with the bit, okay? Here it is. They live in Arendelle, and Elsa is a princess, and she has the power of, 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 of making winter happen. And she is so powerful with her, with her ability that sometimes she, she does things accidentally with her power because it's not controllable. And I know there may be an Elsa person in the sanctuary now. You think you got some power, but don't forget where your power comes from. Elsa, y'all, Elsa, y'all, she has this power to, to, to make things freeze, and, and it so happened on one occasion, she accidentally cast a spell and, and froze the whole town, the whole city, every place where she lived, and so she ran off to the hills, y'all, and she ran off to the hills, her sister Anna came to find her, and as Anna came to find her, Elsa said, don't come close to me because the powers that I have may hurt you, and, and in so doing, she did cast a spell upon Anna's heart, and Anna's hard, y'all, was basically at the place of, of not living and working anymore. And as the story progresses, y'all, we find out that Elsa is now threatened by an evil person coming after her powers. And her sister, Anna, who has a spell on her, comes and defends her for her sister, her sister Elsa. Okay, follow with me. The one with the power is now defended by the one without the power. And the one without the power saves the one with the power. Okay, the one who thought they could do everything couldn't do anything until one who came from nowhere and somewhere saved them from not going. Okay, it's like this. The one with the power had to release and bow down to the one without the power. And the one without the power saved the power for one to come back into power. <laughs> Elsa, y'all, teaches us a lesson. And the lesson is, is that everything that God gives, God gives for a purpose. And don't you misuse the things that God gives you because the purpose of Almighty God always supersedes the powerful or the powerless. Elsa teaches us that if you are humble enough with your gift, God has a way of using that gift to bless somebody else. Well, there's a spell cast on her sister Anna, and Anna, y'all, she does something tremendous. As I said, she comes to the rescue of her sister Elsa, and as she comes to the rescue of her sister Elsa, she gets frozen herself. But as she's frozen herself, y'all, here's what happens because the spell to which Elsa has, it can only be broken, y'all. Here it is, as an act of love will is a thaw a frozen heart. I like that because Olaf, the snowman in the story, y'all, I like the snowman because the snowman gives some phenomenal theology here. The snowman says is that it's the love that comes from the heart really thaws up some frozen hearts around you. It's the love of someone who gives you warmth is able to give comfort to those who may be hurting. Welcome back. First, we'd like to thank you for tuning in today. Prayerfully, Pastor's message touched you in a special way and gets you ready for a new week. If you would like to stay connected to us, we have prayer as well as Bible study throughout the week. Make sure you check the website for more information. Also, if you would like to join the church and become a member of our family, contact us and we'll be more than happy to help you. Also, if you would like to donate, visit our website for all the different ways to give. Again, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, and God bless.